how to pray when you don't know what to say. I am dedicating this message to people who struggle to pray for 10 minutes. If you find yourself praying for five minutes and you run out of words, you don't even know what to tell God. This is your message. Let me first say this. How long we pray does not earn us righteousness, but God cares how long we pray. We spend time with those we love. We spend time doing what we love doing. They that love God spend time with God. Yes, I repeat, God does care how long you spend in prayers. Jesus asked his disciples a question in Matthew 26, 40 to 41. Couldn't you watch and pray for just an hour? Couldn't you watch and pray for just an hour? Jesus was concerned that the disciples were not able to stay in prayer for just an hour. In Acts 3, 1, we read, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. The hour of prayer. They used to pray between 3 and 4 in the afternoon together. And that's besides their personal prayers. What about Jesus? In Mark 1, 35, we read, And in the morning, Jesus, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed a great while before day. A great while before day. This could have been three or four in the morning. Jesus rose, went to a private place where he was all alone doing business with God. That was for many hours. The Bible says that Daniel prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Daniel 6.10, he prayed three times a day. Now, this was his custom. The average Jew prays three times a day. Muslims pray five times a day. The average Christian prays for five minutes in their car on their way to work, and they're exhausted. They wait for Sunday for pastor to pray for them. May I suggest this morning, prayer is more important than service. The Apostle James wrote, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. James 1.27, pure and genuine religion is taking care of the orphans and the widows. Yet James himself, with Peter and John and the 12 apostles, refused to compromise prayers to take care of the widows and the orphans. There was a dispute between the Greek Christians and the Hebrew Christians. The Greeks complained that the Hebrews are taking the larger share, so the Greek widows are not getting enough food during the distribution of food. So they asked for Peter, John, and James, the elders of the church, to intervene. And they refused. Instead, they appointed deacons to oversee the distribution of food. Then they said, then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word, Acts 6, 4. We are not going to spend time taking care of the widows, which is pure religion before God, which is what we ought to be doing as Christians, but we choose not to compromise, not to delegate our time in prayer and teaching the word. Let me tell you the truth, children of God. The main reason people fight in the church is when you are more concerned with serving God than spending time with God. Every time there is a dispute in church, it's because people are preoccupied 
and obsessed with serving God more than spending time with God. We are more concerned with serving God more than knowing God. And that's the source of every trouble in church. Martha complained to Jesus, Mary is not helping me with the kitchen work. She can't help me fix the dish. She can't even help in the kitchen. Jesus told Martha, you are concerned and bothered by many things. Mary is concerned with the right thing, sitting at my feet, hearing my word. So Martha was offended because she was concerned with the kitchen. In this church, I don't allow people to cook when we have our breakfast or our brunch or our lunch or even our anniversary. I outsource all catering services. Why? I do not want anyone to miss prayer and the word of God in the name of fixing for us lunch or dinner. And that's the same thing I want to urge you. No matter what department you do in church, ushering, teaching Sunday school, singing, sound, media, cameras, it doesn't matter what you do in this church. Don't desire to serve God more than knowing God. Never desire to serve God more than spending time with God. You will always be offended if you take that approach. So the disciples decided prayer and the word of God is more important than service. Service is what is true religion. It is acceptable to God, but not at the expense of knowing God. So spending time at the feet of Jesus is more important than washing the feet of Jesus. This morning, I want to teach you seven elements of prayer, actually seven steps to help you pray. From today, let me never hear anyone listening to me that you did not know what to tell God in prayer. I want to tell you exactly what to tell God in prayer. The seven steps of prayer, or rather the seven elements of prayer. Number one, praise. What's praise? Telling God what he has done. Psalms 104 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Why? For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Look at verse 4 again. David says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. A thanksgiving offering is what they used to do in those days. Because God had commanded, never go to the temple empty-hearted. He had said, no one shall come before me empty-hearted. In New Living Translation, no one should come before me without an offering. You can read that in Exodus 23.15, Exodus 34.20 and Deuteronomy 16, 16. So David said, when I'm getting into the gates of the temple, I will have my offering. But when I'm getting into the courts where men used to pray, I will enter into the prayer chambers with praise. With praise. Why? Because his faithfulness continues through all generations. So let me break it down for you. You praise God by telling him what he has done over the generations. Lord, I praise you that you created the universe in five days. And on the sixth day, oh God, you created us in, our, in your own image. Lord, I praise you for you delivered your children from the land of bondage in Egypt with a mighty hand. They crossed the Red Sea as though it was dry land. You gave them bread in the morning and meet in the afternoon every single day for 40 years. I praise you for the way the walls of Jericho came down. They crossed the river Jordan because you parted the waters of the Jordan. Lord, I praise you for the way you delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. You delivered Daniel from the den of lions. 
You delivered Peter from prison. You delivered Paul and Silas from prison. You raised Jesus Christ from among the dead. I praise you. You praise God for what he has done across generations, including recent generations. Praise God for the crusades that were done by T.L. Osborne, Reinhard Bonke, Benny Hinn, Oro Roberts. Praise God for the revival in the church. You praise God for what he has done over the generations because his faithfulness continues through all generations. I repeat, you begin your prayer, you begin your prayers in praises. Praise opens the heavens. Pray, praise clears the heavenly realms. It clears you up for prayers. The second step, the second stage in prayer is worship. What's worship? Telling God who he is. And God never leaves us anything to chance. He never leaves anything to chance. He tells us exactly what to tell him in worship. For example, in Revelation 7, 11 to 12. All the ages were studying around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Seven blessings. Personally, when I'm getting into worship, I love worshiping God with his revealed names. I tell God, you are Jehovah El Shaddai, the almighty God. You are Jehovah Adonai, the sovereign God. You are Jehovah Elion, the most high God. You are Jehovah El Olam, the everlasting God. You are Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. You are Jehovah Hoseenu, the Lord our maker. You are Jehovah Elohim, the Lord our God, the only true God. You are Jehovah Eroi, the Lord who sees me. You are Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. You are Jehovah Rohi. The Lord, our shepherd. Your Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals us. Your Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. Your Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner. Your Jehovah Sid Kenu, the Lord, our righteousness. You are Jehovah Mekodish Kem, the Lord, our sanctifier. You are Jehovah Shama, the ever present God. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You are my A to Z. A for the Almighty God. B for the Blessed God. C for the Creator God. D for the Delivering God. E for the Everlasting God. F for the Faithful God. G for the Glorious God. H for the Holy God. I for the Immortal God. J for the just God, M for the merciful God, L for the loving God. And you can go on and on and on. Put all the biblical adjectives A to Z in your own language and tell God who he is. Most often than not, when I begin to worship God, I release my mind, my heart, my body, and my tongue to the Holy Spirit. I offer my body as a living sacrifice to God. And I allow the Holy Spirit to speak through me, uttering mysteries using angelic languages. Out of my belly flows rivers of living waters. Waters that cause healing and deliverance and hope. That's the moment I'm intimate with God. I commune with God. I fellowship with God. I lock the world outside of me. And I get lost in Jesus. I get lost in the Holy Spirit. That's communion with God. That's what we call worship. 
Number three, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is acknowledging what God has done for you. First Thessalonians 5.18, giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We don't thank God for sickness, but we thank God even in sickness. We don't thank God for being served with an eviction notice, but we thank God even after being served with an eviction notice. We don't thank God for joblessness, but we thank God even in joblessness. Why? Things could have been worse. You could have been on a hospital bed in ICU, but God has kept you whole and strong. So for me, when I'm doing my prayers, this is how I thank God. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of salvation, the gift of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins. Thank you that I am whole and healthy. Lord, you delivered me from the operation table when I went through heart failure. Lord, you delivered me from three serious road accidents where the cars were write-offs. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me with mercy a beautiful, God-fearing woman who loves you, who is supportive. You are the reason my marriage is standing. Thank you for blessing us with two children who are whole, some parents got children who are disabled. Thank you that they are obedient. We have never struggled with them. They love serving you in the house of God. They are doing well in their academics. Thank you, Lord, for my parents. They are kids who never saw their parents. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry you have given me. Thank you for Family Church. Thank you for our worship team. Thank you for the ushers. Thank you for the intercessors. Thank you for the media and the south team. Thank you for the sanctuary. Thank you for the cameras. Thank you for the equipment you've given us, oh God. Thank you for the influence you have given me on social media and around the world. Thank you for the house you've given me. Thank you for every piece of furniture. Thank you for my phone. Thank you for the gadgets. Thank you for the cars. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I thank God item by item for what he has done for me. That's thanksgiving. Jesus healed ten lepers. Only one came to give thanks. And he asked him, where are the other nine? God is happy when we are grateful. Number four, confession. What's that? Asking God to forgive our sins. Repenting our sins. You first repent every known sin, and then you can ask God to forgive you what you do not know. The psalmist prayed in Psalms 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and see whether there is something impure in me. You cannot ask God to search you when you have not repented your known sins. When you come to God and you remember your sins, go before him and say, Lord, forgive me. I lied to my boss yesterday that I was sick and I was not sick. Lord, forgive me. I slept in the wrong bed. Lord, forgive me. I used cursing words yesterday when I got angry with my husband. Lord, forgive me. I did not come to church because of laziness. I did not give because of rebellion or fear that I do not have enough. And then you can ask God to search you. 1 John 1, 8-9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. So when you repent your sins, don't allow the enemy to accuse you anymore. Don't let the enemy keep reminding you about a sin that you have repented. Learn to accept the forgiveness of God. Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. This was a daily prayer, a daily confession. Every moment you come to pray, the Lord himself 
told us to repent our sins. The steps I'm giving you are the steps Jesus taught about prayers. The disciples came to Jesus and told him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he taught them exactly as I'm doing right now, or what we call the Lord's Prayer. Number five, intercession. What's that? Intercession is asking God to meet the needs of others, praying for others. Let me tell you, saints, always pray for others before you pray for yourself. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made to all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good. And pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The scriptures are clear. Why should we pray for people in leadership? Some of them are corrupt. Two reasons. That we may live a peaceful life. Number two, because God loves everyone and he wants everyone to come to the knowledge of of the truth. Imagine if Vladimir Putin was a born-again Christian. We wouldn't be having that war right now. A decision by a leader leads many people to death. Some of them may not be bombing, but because of corruption, their nations are starving. People are living in abject poverty because of decisions made by leaders. So as a Christian, it's your duty, it's your obligation to pray for leaders. Ezekiel twenty-two thirty. God spoke to Ezekiel. I looked for a man in Israel or a woman who could stand in the gap on behalf of the nation, and I found none. Therefore, I destroyed the country. There was not a single man who could stand in the gap, not a single woman. It is very easy for you to assume others are praying. You know, I have been observing the trade in Ukraine every single day. And I realized the first month, for some strange reason, Ukraine was gaining a lot of mileage. And I do believe a lot of people were praying and then they got reluctant. The last two weeks, Russia has been advancing westwards. The thing is this, when you're interceding, Pray as though you are the only one praying for that country, praying for that family, praying for that person. So how do we pray for others? Four levels. Number one, pray for the country. Pray for the leaders. Pray for the president. Whether you are blue or red, it doesn't matter. Pray for the one in authority. Pray for the Congress. Pray for the Senate. Pray for the local leaders, the state leaders. Number two, Pray for the church. Pray for revival in the church of Jesus Christ. Pray for many Christians who have been persecuted in the Middle East, in China, in India. Pray for your local church here. Pray that God may increase us in numbers, in love, in wisdom, in resources, in influence. Number three, pray for your friends. Remember them by their name. Be specific. Oh God, remember our sister Irene. She has been having cancer for the last five years. Come through for her, oh God. Relieve her pain. Dear Lord, remember our brother Alex. He's been jobless for the last three years. He needs to provide to his family. Come through for him, oh God, and bless him with a job. Pray for your friends for their specific needs. And then number four, Pray for your family members. Lord God, remember John. He's stuck in drugs in a cohorizin. Lord, set him free. Remember the marriage of our sister Barbara. They are not doing well, our Lord and God. Come through for her. We pray for their peace. Lord, we thank you for our brother Dan. We pray for the scholarship 
of his son. He's going to the university and he doesn't have the means. May you come through for him. That's called intercession, praying for others. It's amazing that God wants you to remember others before you remember yourself. And number six, pray for yourself. We call it supplication. Asking God to meet your needs. In Matthew 6, 7 and 8, Jesus said, And when you pray, not if you pray, why? Jesus took it for granted that you pray. Jesus didn't say if you pray. Jesus never said if you fast. He said when you pray. He said when you fast. He took it for granted. Believers ought to pray. So let me read again. And when you pray, do not keep on bubbling like pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Which begs the question, if God knows our needs, why should we tell him? You see, we don't pray to inform God. We pray to invite God into our situations. Even before you pray, God already knows. So when you pray, you are partnering with God. You are asking God to take over. You are telling God you are interested in him meeting your needs. I need us to know this. Jesus is saying, don't repeat yourself like pagans. They think by over repeating themselves, they will be heard. What is Jesus saying? Be specific. Write down your prayer items so that when God answers one after another, you will be able to give thanks and God gets the glory. Write it down. Lord, I am now praying, bless me with a wife. I want a beautiful woman this height, and I want a woman who is prayerful, but not too much, oh God. I don't want someone who will be waking up at night when I'm asleep. But I'm praying, oh God, I'm, I'm just imagining your prayer item. One perhaps who has a college diploma or college degree, this is your prayer item. You have no apologies for it. Lord, I'm praying for this woman who is very supportive and humble, who will be able perhaps to submit to me, and we can work together. I'm praying for a woman who is entrepreneurial because I want to get into business. I want someone who can support me in business. Specify what you're looking for. That works the other way around if you're praying for a man. If you're praying for a job, just tell God, God, I'm praying. I have, I have done my application in Coca-Cola to be the head of strategy. I pray that my CV will be looked at with favor. I'm praying for my work environment, that God, I will get guys around me who we will be able to agree, read from the same script. We will be team players. I'm praying for my boys to be a God-fearing person. Lord, I'm praying for a job where I will work on a Monday through Friday. I don't want to work over the weekends. I want to relax over the weekends and to go to church. Lord, I'm praying for a scholarship, specifically Yale University. And I want to do medicine. God, can you provide that for me? I know nothing is impossible with you. In John 14, 14, you said, ask me whatever you want and I will do it. Lord, I hold you accountable on your word. This is my prayer item. You see, Specify your prayer items. Write them down. And then keep praying. That doesn't mean you repeat yourself. There's a difference between repeating yourself and being persistent. Persistence means you pray for the same item until God answers. Repeating yourself means, Oh God, heal our brother Doug. Oh God, heal Doug. Oh God, heal Doug for 30 minutes. You're not praying. You're wasting time. God is not deaf. You're bubbling like the Pharisees. That's what they used to do. And Jesus warned us not to treat God as though he is deaf 
or he is not interested in answering our prayers. Jesus asked a question. If we have been wicked, when our child asks us for a bread, a loaf of bread, we don't give them a rock. When they ask for fish, we don't give them a snake. Yet we are wicked. How much more shall our righteous father give good things to his children? So you don't need to babble, but it means you can pray for the same prayer item for weeks, for months, even for years. God promised Abraham a child at the age of 75. God answered that prayer when Abraham was 100 years. You can pray for a husband when you're 24. And you get that husband when you're 45. Because you have no clue what is God, God is protecting you from. He could be protecting you from yourself. Because you are not ready for marriage. And if he blessed you earlier, you would end up in divorce. Somebody taught me to pray when I was 15. And I looked at this woman. It was a woman. She was teaching in our high school. I never heard that thing before. And then she told us to pray for our wives. When you tell a 15-year-old boy to pray for a wife, they look at you and think, is everything all right, Madam Preacher? But you know, I looked at her, and my priority that time was to pass my high school education. But I trusted her, and I didn't know what I was doing. And I prayed for a wife. That time I had no feelings for a woman. We were just playing boys together. And I began to pray. Finally, God blessed me the woman when I was 25. So God may not necessarily answer that prayer. I mean, I got married when I was 25, but I met her when I was 20. But she was still not mine. Before your wedding day, there used to be a lot of guys who used to make girls change their mind. So she made the vows when I was 25. What's my message? You can pray for something and God answers the prayer weeks later. Does that make sense? Sometimes months later. You can pray for a house and tell God, Lord, I don't even have the 10% deposit that the bankers are asking for. But pray for that house. I remember when we got married with Mercy, we wrote a number of prayer items. A long list. Everything looked impossible. Ten years later, 100% of what we prayed for God had answered. One of the things we prayed for, God blessed us with a house. Ten years later, God had blessed us with two houses. Zero debt. God answers prayers. L write them down. Trust God for what you're praying for. It may not be answered right now, but in the right season, God will answer it. And last Sunday, I taught you about seasons. Sometimes when we pray and we don't see answers immediately, we think we are doing something wrong. No! It's just that it may not be the right season. It may not be your harvest season. When your season comes, you reap the harvest. Does that make sense? Number seven and the last one, waiting. Waiting on God. Being quiet in God's presence. Isaiah 40, 30 to 31. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run, run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When you pray, I suggest don't rush out of your prayer chamber. Hold on for a couple of minutes waiting on God. Many times, believers, we just talk to God, and then you take off. Hold on and wait on God. Be still and know that he is God. Psalms 46.10. And waiting on God also means waiting on in prayers without giving up. For a day, for a week, for a month, until God answers. Sometimes what I like doing after I pray is to wait on God completely in silence. Or I open the book of Psalms or any other passage and I start reading the scriptures to hear from God, for God to clarify what he's telling me. 
I don't want to rush through my prayers. I want to learn to wait on God. Were you blessed by this message? Are you blessed by my ministry? I would like to invite you to be my ministry partner by sending me your love offering every month. I've shared with you the giving options on the screen. Help me to spread the gospel around the world. And remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to hit the bell to get notified whenever I upload new videos. And if you're visiting the Atlanta Metropolis or you live around the Atlanta area, welcome to Family Church, 287 Mount Calvary Road, Marietta, Georgia.